Hi, good morning everyone, and thank you again for joining us today for Cordium's New York Department of Financial Services Cybersecurity Regulation Webinar. You'll see on the screen right now a box up front showing where you'll be able to enter questions during this presentation. We'll either grab those as we're going through the discussion or we'll tee them up for the end of the conversation. You have with me today here is my I sorry. Speaking today is Michael Corsion. I'm the Managing Director of Cordium Cybersecurity and Data Protection Services. And joining me today is my colleague Richard Hudson, our Vice President and Lead Information Security Technologist. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Right. So we appreciate your time. And we know the New York Department of Financial Services regulation that's come out has been on a lot of people's radar. Uh, most of you know this announcement came out originally in September of last year, Governor Cuomo putting the proposal out, which has really been recognized as one of the most stringent in the United States, as, as well as globally for that fact. And the regulation basically went into effect March 1st, 2017, and is requiring all covered entities to annually prepare and submit to the superintendent a certification of compliance with the New York State Department of Financial Services showing that the firm is in compliance with the outlined areas that we'll cover today. The covered entities are going to have 180 days from that effective date to comply and as mentioned that certification that will need to be signed next January is going to be requiring the signature of a senior officer within the organization. So what we're going to go through today and what we've outlined on this slide here are the 16 specific domain categories that the S, I'm sorry, that the New York Department of Financial Services has outlined. And we've categorized them into your standard technology terms and people, process, and technology. A lot is going to focus around the process and what the regulator wants to get an understanding from firms and the assessments that they conduct is how are they going through these specific areas and what best practices they're applying from a security perspective, from a compliance perspective, from a testing perspective, and an overall governance across the organization. So we'll come in here and we'll look across the first section 500.02 where the SEC has laid out for firms to establish a cybersecurity program. And a lot of organizations have some aspect of this today, but what the guidance that the NYDFS has put across is for firms to focus a little more on a NIST approach, which is basically taking a risk-based approach and going through identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So Rich, I know in your career that your main role has really been facing off with regulators when they've been coming in reviewing information security programs and your experience working for a large multinational bank for almost 20 years in the role of CISO. Um, can you just explain to the group a little bit about the NIST approach and really why the regulators have, not only for the NYDFS, but, but globally seem to focus on this? Yeah, sure. NIST is um, more or less, as we all know, a few years ago, a uh, framework was put together uh, mainly because there was no uh, standardized methodology in the marketplace. Um, the, the framework, uh, and especially here where it talks about a security program, uh, a lot of firms, um, if they haven't done it yet, have to realize that the, the program is separate from the policy. And what the regulators are looking for here is to make sure that the, the program, which should be very high level, um, reflects the core principles of the framework which are represented here, those five elements. Um, so yeah, definitely the idea here is to make sure that the program is reflecting these five years at a high level. And as we have broken on the slide, um, you know, it, it does map in those five areas uh, very well with the overall uh, framework um, requirements. Okay, great. Thanks, Rich. So in the next section where the NYDFS has outlined a, a real critical element to any information security program, cybersecurity program, is going to be having a sound cybersecurity policy and making sure that it contains 
and covers the 14 elements listed here specifically going through how you're securing the information, the governance, access controls, your network monitoring, physical security, customer data privacy, risk assessments, incident response. What they want is not only to have the policy but also a process that this is reported to the board of directors on almost an annual basis. So the senior officer that's going to have to sign across the certification we mentioned in the earlier slide has to make sure that the firm is not only uh, documenting their approach in all these areas, but also has the policies to back them up. Rich, I know policies is something that you know you focused on heavily in the past. Any guidance or thoughts? You know, we know a lot of people have some semblance of documentation today, but in a lot of the work we've reviewed for clients, it always seems that in the infosec arena, there's more to be done. Yeah, definitely. And and just to quickly mention, as I just said a few minutes ago, the 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 program, cybersecurity program is different from the cybersecurity policy. The, I've been in examinations where the uh, FRB came in and NYDFS came in and said, can you explain your cybersecurity program? So it has to be very clear that the two are separate. The policy here is definitely um, being given you more or less the, the template of what should be in your documentation. And what firms typically do with the four categories here is to more or less create these into chapters. And in some instances, you may want to have, for example, your vendor policy um, separate, but the security policy can reference that further details are in, a, in the vendor policy, which is not a document. In addition, same similar thing with the instant response. That's a totally different area. So. The, again, the cybersecurity policy can make reference to that document, which would have further detail. So in terms of putting the policy together, it doesn't have to be 100 pages, but it should reflect these 14 areas. And where it's a clearly distinct process um, that could stand on its own, possibly depending on your environment, you make reference to another document, which would have further detail. Um, it's pretty much the best way to put these these uh, details together. I think that's a great point, Rich, pointing out that some of the documents, you know, should be their own separate exclusive item, you know, when a regulator or anybody that you're going to have to share the policy with, you definitely don't want to have to give away more than need be. And I think the one you called out on the vendor and third-party service provider is one we've specifically seen regulators in the last six to 12 months call out firms and have deficiency notices written for not having a, a separate policy there that distinctly goes through how you're risk rating your vendors and then what level of due diligence you're doing based on, on each of those risk criteria. So moving into the next slide of you know category 500.04, the Chief Information Security Officer. So what the NYDFS is calling for here is that each firm shall designate a qualified CISO for overseeing the cyber program and enforcing the policy. Now in some cases it may not be um, business practical to have a dedicated CISO within a local branch, especially if it may be part of an international organization and the branch here has a, a small footprint. So in those cases, the NYDFS will recognize the use of a third party that can facilitate this role. But what the primary function is going to be, and it'll still have to be a senior officer from the bank or the financial institution that is going to have to sign off on the report going upwards. And so the, the role of the CISO or whoever is facilitating that role, whether being internal or a third party, is really helping conduct developing the annual reporting that's going to go up to leadership. And Rich, I know you've written many, many of these reports and have worn that CISO role for many years. We list some of the items down on the bottom of what the report should conclude. Any specific areas or you know guidance you want to give our attendees today into you know what the regulators really want to see in that report and how it should be messaged? Yeah, definitely. When it comes to the uh, reporting to the board, um, the, the key here, and I'm sure uh, many of you on the webinar today have gone through this, the, the report has to more or less identify 
the, the, the critical points and the, the areas of emphasis that need uh, support and focus from the senior management. Um, so it should be very uh, concise, very uh, clear um, to point out where the firm needs to focus on any particular security issues, um, especially as it pertains to the regulators. So, um, you know, the report typically should be, a, you know, no more than five pages if so much, but it should be very clear to reflect the security posture of the firm to the senior management so they can know if there is an issue or if everything is going according to their expectations for, for the security in the firm. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Rich, that it, you know, should be short, not extensive. Uh, too often reports that are funneled up to leadership tend to be very noisy and have a lot of real technical details, whereas leadership really just has to have an understanding of the risk. And I think probably the most important bullet on, on the item down below is number four. So it's the effectiveness of the program. Having the policies and everything documented is going to go a long way with the regulators. But from a security perspective, unless you're doing some testing, some validation of what is in the policy is actually being adhered to and in compliance, uh, your, your program is, is really not going to be complete in the eyes of the regulator. So coming in as talking about testing, so not only testing against the policy, but also some specific testing against your network, uh, penetration testing, vulnerability assessments. These are things that are going to check the hygiene of your network internally and externally based on the scope of what you're going to conduct. Um, what the NYDFS is calling for is that the penetration test be done at least annually and vulnerability scanning be conducted at least quarterly. And so this will be a process to go through and look for weaknesses within the organization. You're also going to look at certain areas where that could be impacted by a third party. So Rich, penetration testing, vulnerability scanning, you've read through thousands of these reports. Uh, we know a lot of firms are conducting them today, but in regards to the NYDFS, anything that you think will change um, in regards to how they're doing it today and what they should be doing based sure. on regulation? Yeah, sure, definitely. When it comes to penetration testing, uh, and again, most firms should already be doing this, um, although not specifically stated, both internal and external penetration testing needs to be done. Um, one of the recommendations also in the market is to make sure that you rotate your pen tester. So in other words, every, you know, maybe you, you may have a five-year cycle where you go back to the vendor who did it the very first time. Um, vulnerability assessments, uh, that typically is done internally uh, by IT team. Depending on your firm, uh, you may want to, if you don't have the expertise in-house, uh, you can always get a third party to do that. But as the regulators have pointed out, the expectation is that these two uh, testing areas are performed as stated in, in terms of frequency. And um, again, the reporting from these tests should be very clear to management if there's any particular issues with the um, penetration testing and vulnerability assessment on your systems. And a key component too on these items is going to be the follow-up also. So when the reports generate what action items uh, are suggested based on their risk level of a low, medium, or high, that the firm evidences and documents the decision process to remediate against some of those findings or even accept those findings and determine that the risk didn't justify the effort to, to remediate. Coming into the next slide that we'll take a look at is going to be around the audit trail. So what organizations need to be doing and probably have systems capturing information today is really have it in more of a format that can be reviewed more frequently, that it can be stored and maintained, and really be in an area that's protected from alteration or, or tampering. So a lot of when a cyber event happens, it leads to the forensic trail. And so having a sufficient and, uh, you know, a logging system an ability to, to track logs from multiple systems internally and be able to produce these records, uh, not only for the regulator, but also in the event of a breach and trying to track down what 
series of events led to the breach uh, is going to be pretty critical. Rich, on the audit trail, I know this is one that the regulators not only want to come in and see that you're doing, but can also be pretty useful. Any specifics on your thoughts around tools, maybe, and solutions, and really managing these, these audit trails that can somewhat be, uh, be massive? Yeah, sure. Uh, one of the things that I, I've seen, which the, the regulators tend not to, not to like too much, uh, is when audit trails, um, companies use spreadsheets. To, to track and monitor um, any particular issues, um, what have you. They, they prefer that there be some type of uh, system because when you use a spreadsheet, there, there's no um, logging or tracking of who updated the spreadsheet or what have you. So it's, it's better first and foremost to look at you know, what solution will you put in place for your audit trails. Um, definitely there are several in the market um, and of course, if there's any particular area in this uh, topic that you have any questions on, we can help with that. But certainly from a regulatory perspective, they are looking for a system and not a, a spreadsheet when it comes to uh, the type of audit trails and, and tracking of your issues. Yeah, and I guess one of the important items of that system, whether a SharePoint or a GRC type tool, is also being able to you know, upload documents and artifacts around your system, not only for the records and the logs that were produced, but even just the review of the logs and to be able to show a regulator that testing component within the program is, is being conducted. So we'll come into the next section, dot 07, which is access privileges. So this has always been a hot spot with all the regulators and really that you have under a good understanding within the organization about access to your systems, about limiting access, really should only be to those that fully require the need. And then even at the time of, so the, the principle of least privilege, um, but that it's fully aligned to job descriptions and that ongoing reviews are being done. We call it a heavy focus on your joiners, movers, leavers. So sometimes people move within the organization and may be given rights to a, a certain area for a specific project or time frame. So all these need to be reviewed and have some periodic oversights. Rich, on the access management, the hotspot with mm -hmm. the regulators at all times. Any specific thoughts on that? And I know actually when we look at this, we also want to consider third parties and, and third party systems, right? Yeah, definitely. The, the regulators are looking here for firms to have some type of identity access management system or solution because managing users, um, if it's not done in an automated type fashion or, or systematic fashion, there tend to be some people who fall through the cracks and um, <laughs> typically found out when either internal audit comes to do a review or when the regulators come to do a review. Uh, one of the other things here which have is of significant importance also are those um, cloud systems that companies tend not to do a good job of tracking their users for those systems. So definitely there has to be some form of uh, a system for identity and access management and it has to incorporate not just the internal systems managed by the, 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 firm, the firm IT department or security but also any outside uh, systems that are in the cloud that are managed externally by those particular cloud providers. Now, I think that's a great point, Rich, because you know a lot of us tend to rely on our IT department and Active Directory and give us and giving us single sign-on capabilities. But a lot of your third-party applications just don't integrate with those systems. So you may have an employee that was provided access to a paid service that the organization uses, and so managing or oversight of that access may, may be limited. And in some cases, maybe you have to resort to some manual oversight on removing that access if the employee should, should leave the firm. So having an understanding of all types of access to all types of data and then having that tracked, as we mentioned in the previous slide, in, in some type of system will be ultimately helpful for them. So coming into the next category, application security. So a lot of banks and institutions are using custom developed applications or applications that are integrating with third parties. And what we're looking at here really is how, so the applications need to be tested for their vulnerabilities, 
but also what they're going to look at is the development process. So the traditional software development lifecycle and putting another S in front of it and secure software development lifecycle. So how is the firm going through and, and defining their procedures when developing code, doing code reviews, um, even change management for updates to the code, application development, proper release management, all those practices around your customized applications and so making sure that those are there's good and sound practices around those. Rich, I know the application area is, is definitely one of the more vulnerable that we've seen in organizations just because of the complexity and even people leveraging, you know, open source code and areas of that nature. What do you think the regulators are going to zone in on specifically when it comes to the application security? Yeah, definitely the regulators are going to be looking at the procedures and policies around how you implement internal systems as well as, as, well as external systems. Uh, there's, there has to be, from a security perspective, testing to ensure that these applications are secure. Uh, Cross-site scripting, um, you name it, when it comes to these applications, there has to be a, some type of program uh, checklist process in place to make sure you can cross all your T's and dot all your I's when it comes to making sure the application is secure. Um, but the worst thing is assuming that the application meets all requirements. You have to test them. And in addition to testing them, you have to make sure that you document that you have tested it in the event that a regulator asks you to prove that you've done your due diligence. Now, definitely on the change management, I think probably a lot of people on today's webinar uh, heard of Amazon's outage they had a couple weeks ago, which was really through a, a change management process and not having things fully tested and going through the checklist and, and caused some of the largest websites in the world to be down for, for several hours. So it can really be catastrophic if you're making changes that are going through the full security review. Uh, next, come to the risk assessment. So this is listed as number nine. It probably is really could be number one and upfront where the construct around your program is really giving you the foundation of, of how you move forward. So there are a lot of ways to conduct an assessment approach. I think what you know the regulators will want to see is that you're leveraging one of their tools, one of their frameworks. Um, the FFIEC has put out an assessment tool and a handbook that also goes through and really helps a firm when conducting an assessment either internally or through the use of a third party have the construct around their program that will be recognized by the regulators that you've not only gone through the categories of identifying the inherent risk to the organization but also what's your maturity and gaps in regards to some of the information security controls and then I think most importantly coming down to the last part there, Rich, is around you know, how the identified risks will be mitigated or accepted. So you've conducted many, many assessments yourself. We're doing several of these for clients today. Um, you know, your thoughts on the assessment process and, and I guess really where the regulators looked at mm -hmm. maybe having a third party do it versus conducting it internally or in conjunction with doing it internally. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Mike. In, in my experience with the, the risk assessment, um, most times when this is done the first time, the results are not good. And what I've told, you know, the management and previous um, uh, clients we've worked with, that's okay. The, the thought is that if it's not as expected, at least the management will have an idea of what potential areas they need to focus on to improve those areas. And the regulators see that as really understanding your environment and then making are taking action to, to make the improvements. Uh, if the first time you do the assessment and everything is fine, that's a red flag and the regulators will pick it up. So the idea here behind the assessment is to make sure that, as, as Mike mentioned, you have regulatory provided tools, uh, the CAC that some of you may, have, may know. Um, and definitely the idea here is to ensure that you do it thoroughly. Now the regulators would want to make sure that this is done correctly. And a lot of times you have firms who would contract with a third party to make sure it's accurate. In my experience, when the, the firm does it themselves, they're subject to more scrutiny because they have the ability 
to adjust the the report and the assessment to suit their their particular environment. So the independence of the assessment is very important, and um, you know it's it's always a good thing to have someone else uh, double check, if you will, uh, just to make sure. Because again, the results of these assessments are going to the board and also to the regulators. So you want to make sure that it is done correctly to properly reflect the the firm's security posture. Because if it if it has been modified in any way from the actual results, they'll find out. So it's best to be on the side of caution when we do these assessments to make sure that you do it correctly. And it doesn't hurt to have someone look over your shoulder to um, make sure it's done right. Right. You know, and when conducting an assessment, you know, a good recommendation or really should say a requirement of any assessment process is that it's going to result in a strategic plan something that outlines how the firm is going to evaluate the risk-based decisions that need to be discussed going forward. And so once you've done the assessment that you are actively discussing where you have gaps and weaknesses and what's going to be the plan going forward or the risk acceptance process. But definitely show the regulators that you've taken some action since then. Uh, we'll come into the next slide here which is going to talk about cybersecurity, personnel, and intelligence. So from a personnel perspective, you really have to make sure and keep your staff educated, provide training, making sure that people that are in specific roles in regards to the information security are keeping updated on not only what are the best tools, solutions, industry best practices, but also the threats that are out there. So when we talk about that phrase of intelligence, intelligence is a, uh, a real key when it comes to cybersecurity and so understanding what harmful uh, threat actors, uh, viruses, malware, ransomware type items are out there and really just from a, a threat landscape perspective is, is really critical in helping make those risk-based decisions that were coming forward. And Rich, I know you for years have subscribed to many services around threat intelligence that not only help people get smarter but also increase their awareness. Any couple quick thoughts here on, on the intel and personnel? Oh, yeah, sure. Definitely, um, you know, cybersecurity basically changes every day uh, in terms of the threats and the intelligence out there. So it, it's very important for the staff to keep up to date and current on what's going on. Um, there are many services that provide um, the potential threats and, and issues out there. Uh, in addition, um, most of you should know about FSISAC, which is a information sharing entity provided uh, for financial services. Uh, it's a pretty good organization. Um, and one of the things that they do every year is to have a simulated uh, test of cybersecurity. So um, definitely it's a good learning experience for the, the cybersecurity personnel and also to share uh, the intelligence that is, is pretty common throughout the financial services community. Okay, great. Thanks, Rich. Sure. So our next slide is a busy slide. A lot of information on here. And so if you remember before talking about the policies, Rich specifically called out third party information, third party vendor risk management policy as something that would be a standalone policy because of its depth. Um, what the regulators are going to want to see is that, and this is such a broad topic here that we're actually going to have a follow-up webinar next week that will go through specific uh, topics on vendor and third-party risk management, but they want to see firms are really taking a risk-based approach. So getting an understanding of what your third parties have in regards to risk of your organization, which usually leads by the data they have access to, whether within your network or storing um, on their systems, access they have to your network. And so what a firm really has to understand, especially if they are storing your data or having access to your data, is getting an understanding of what their information security program looks like. So doing some form of assessment over how they handle their data, reviewing their information security policies and all the types of activities that they are doing in regards to protecting information. Rich, I know we're going to have another webinar mm -hmm. on vendor risk management specifically next week, but any of the topics on here or just, um, you know, at a high level, first thoughts and approaches when clients are tackling the vendor risk management area. Yeah, sure, definitely. I mean, one, one of the key things, which is 
simple to say, but uh, I guess difficult to implement, is to ensure that the, the third parties have the same level of security that you do or, or more. Uh, regulators are looking for some way to, to show that your requirements of the third party from a security perspective have been met and that you've documented that. Um, another thing to, to be very careful of, and you know, I know a lot of firms struggle with this, is when, whenever you have a request of the vendor, let's say it's not a hard bleed issue, and sometimes you ask the vendor, can you let me know if you are compliant and update, update your patches, you're lucky if you get a response. So one of the things that the examiners are looking for in terms of vendor compliance is ongoing monitoring of that vendor. Um, there are different ways to do it, and um, certainly we can explain how, a little bit more in our next webinar how that works. But definitely the, the examiners are looking for the vendor to comply with your security requirements and that the that you follow up and do some type of continuous monitoring to make sure that they stay on top of their security posture. Thanks. And this is an area that we've definitely seen some uh, fines being handed out by some recent regulators. The SEC put one out to an investment advisor that didn't do sufficient due diligence over a cloud provider. They entrusted the cloud provider with customer information. The cloud provider had a breach and it was the investment advisor that was fined $75,000 because they did not make sure the environment they allowed the data to be stored was secure and sufficient. So it really comes down to you are responsible for where you're placing the data, so you need to make sure that you're checking the boxes and doing that oversight of your, of your third party. Um, next item coming into is the multi-factor authentication. And so, Rich, there's some specific areas here where the regulators looking to call out for multi-factor to be employed, um, some of it being risk-based, some around individual and web applications. Some of your thoughts on multi-factor, I know this is something that's been evolving and, and, and gaining a, a larger footprint in the financial services, but from the regulator standpoint and how they're upping the mark in this, this category. Yeah, definitely. Um, what what I've seen and what the regulators have pointed out to some firms is that, you know, to use a password and, for example, IP address using IP filtering, that's not multi-factor authentication. Um, some firms have argued that, you know, you know, IP filtering is one of the, the methods for multi-factor. It's not secure. As we all know, you can spoof an IP address. So they're looking for more. Um, would it be you know, an RC token, some type of method where, as we have at the bottom, something you know, something you have, something you are. You know, they're looking for that type of uh, multi-factor implementation and, and definitely uh, if you have not yet implemented those for your um, remote connectivity, uh, something you have to look at certainly before uh, January next year. Okay, great. Thanks, Rich. Yep. The next section that they're calling out is the limitations on data retention. And so they're really calling for a timely destruction of any non-public information. And so it's no longer necessary for the provisions to be held out indefinitely. And even from a risk perspective, you know, a firm should want to have a defined time when they will have end of life of data. Um, and remove that liability from the books. So, Rich, I know data retention has been something that's been around for quite a while. Anything specific on, on this part of it? I, I think maybe more on the destruction policy is probably what, what's more of the highlight. Yeah, definitely. Um, and one of the key things with, with this particular uh, requirement is for you to determine what to retain and what to destroy, one of the first steps is to make sure you classify your documents or your data. Um, so whatever methodology you use, you should be able to classify what's critical, um, what's you know, important and sensitive and what have you. Then your, your policy will be more effective. Uh, destruction, uh, one of the key things here is to know where you have duplicate information. So internally you have to manage your process to make sure that if you destroy a document, say after the, the six-year requirement from SOX, that you have destroyed every copy of that document because if you do have a copy remaining, it will be, 
if you're required to provide that document, you, you have to provide it, even though you thought you got rid of it. So it's very important to manage your data and know exactly where they exist. That way, when you submit the destruction uh, request, everything or every copy of that document will be known where it exists and it can be destroyed. Yep. One of the documents that was called up earlier in the policy section was around that data classification. So it's definitely one of the more challenging areas for years, but now there are a lot of tools and solutions that will actually allow you to you know, have a system learn a little bit more about the use of data within the organization. So the classification of data has become easier, still can be a pretty big challenge, but as Rich mentioned, it's really the foundation. So um, buttoning that up and, and helping reduce that attack surface is going to really be complemented by a nice sound data classification policy. So coming into section 14 is the training and monitoring. So I think everybody has heard the phrase that your users are the weakest link, that the attackers know that and they will continue to try to get through your users, whether through email spoofs, phone call spoofs, other types of targets, USB drops. Um, there cannot be enough emphasis on user training. And so the regulators want to see that you have not only a program that's integrated to your compliance training on an annual basis, but also that you have ongoing training, ongoing awareness, things that may be updated in the industry, uh, new types of ransomware that are out there, all these types of risks and threats that you can help um, educate your users. I think the one-off annual training has been deemed recently to be not as effective. It does hit the regulatory requirements, and a lot of firms and solutions are going now into more micro-based training, so smaller bursts, more frequent updates, whether you're subscribing to a company newsletter that you can distribute out to the employees to at least give them awareness of you know what type of attacks are out there. And so even on the top box there also that they talk about is the monitoring. So that's also the monitoring of the um, users that aren't authorized to tax into the systems. So Rich, either one of these two points that you want to add a little commentary to? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the things that, that I'll mention here, and a lot of folks who are on the webinar can attest to, um, the regulators have asked me uh, in the past how effective is the training. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to show that it's not just a check the box exercise. You have to document what you have presented. You have to keep a record of who attended and who didn't attend. You have to have follow-up training and show you did that. And they're also looking to, to see maybe you have say a, a, a set of questions afterwards for the for the attendees to make sure they understood what was um, said during the training. And at the end of all of that, you have to put that in a report, which is also part of that board presentation. You know, it's a very, very, as Mike said in the beginning, the users are the weakest link. And it has to be incorporated into that board report when it comes time to present to the board. And again, which eventually will get to the um, the NYDFS for that certificate that has to be signed off. Great, great. And I know, Rich, one of the most popular types of training these days is around the phishing exercises. So a good sequence of events usually is a firm to conduct the phishing exercise using a tool or a third party and then train, see what the failure rate is, conduct training, and then conduct another phishing exercise and see if the failure rate has improved. And so that's probably one of the more effective, more popular methods that, that we're seeing go through today. And then definitely, I think, the testing on the other side or something that generates follow-up video training and also some Q&A that can really show that they've got an understanding of it. So coming into the last few slides here, we're going to talk about the encryption of non-public information. So definitely this is an area where tools and solutions are becoming more prevalent. The cost and ability to manage these tools and solutions is becoming more feasible. Um, Rich, your thoughts on you know the increased requirements around data encryption? Yeah, definitely. The, the regulators are just trying to make sure that firms understand that it doesn't matter where the data is. 
if it is classified as non-public, encryption should be a part of your security program to ensure that the data is protected. Um, they're looking for that. So whether you're going to be sending it out to a third party or even to you know an attorney, what have you, you know it has to be encrypted. Um, there are too many ways, as you know, if it's not encrypted, for it to be intercepted, fall into the wrong hands, and it could be a whole lot of issues with reputation and what have you. So definitely, especially for the financial services, it's expected that whether the data is at risk or in transit, that there's some form of encryption in place to protect the information. Okay, great. Answers. And our next category is going to be the incident response. So this is really an extension of your BCP and DR plans that you have, but as Rich mentioned up front, it would be a separate document, a separate policy that you would lay out, which is going to be an incident response plan identifying at a high level some potential scenarios, so based on threat intelligence and the conversations we've had earlier, identifying scenarios such as ransomware or a data breach or an employee that left the organization that took information with them or corruption in a database through, you know, insecure programming or, or some type of vulnerability that happened. So all this needs to be documented and where you get beyond the BCP and DR it really goes into more of the business response. In a good incident response plan, the upfront component is going to be triaging the technical event, but there's also a whole other series of events and when the business gets involved is when you're reaching out to your general counsel, when you're reaching out to the regulators, when potentially you're calling law enforcement because it is a crime scene. When do you notify employees? Um, it could be an event that could be collusion amongst a couple employees, an insider job, so maybe you don't notify everybody right away. When do you notify investors or customers of what type of breaches? So what are the, the legal requirements for notification? And then what are the best business practices for notification and keeping them updated? I think one of the other items you also tie in here into the incident response is how your third parties tie into the incident response or you fold into their incident response if they have a breach of your data. So Rich, this is the category that helps firms really protect reputation and minimize damage. Um, from the regulator standpoint when they come in, you know, where does the firm really want to make sure they're positioned? Yeah, thanks Mike. Basically one of the key things that regulators look at here is not just to have a plan in place but to actually test it. Um, there may be a lot of instances where all you need to do is some type of uh, tabletop testing. Go through the actual plan, the process, to make sure that if this scenario occurs, that this, everyone knows what their particular role and responsibilities will be. Um, one of the things also is to, you know, it, it helps to have a forensic firm uh, on retainer because you don't want to have an incident where you need to go in that route and at that point you begin to look for someone. The, that should be in the plan. But one of the key things from the regulators is that you have um, at least once a year you have some form of tabletop testing or simulated testing of your plan to make sure that it will work in the event that you have an incident. I think that's a great point too, Rich. I'm, you know, knowing who is going to be called before the event, the last thing you'd want to do is start having to go through contractual discussions about terms and conditions while the event could be going and, and the breach could be expanding through the network on you know, what type of damage control you need to really get in place for them. So definitely the incident response is an area where I think the regulators are, are doing firms a, a big benefit by making sure they're more, insure, more mature in that area. So coming into 17 and just in the last few slides of our presentation this morning is the notice to the superintendent. So Rich, this is the category I think that's really got people um, called to attention <laughs> into this matter. Uh, somebody in the organization is going to have to sign off over the program and so have a good understanding that um, everything is included and everything's been covered from the regulator perspective. Um, so Rich, your thoughts on, you know, if being in the shoes that you were working for a yeah. bank for many, many years, you know, if somebody is put that, has that happened on them, that they're going to have to sign off on this document. Some of just the, the key thoughts and areas that they they should have on the top of their radar. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the key thing here is um, whether it be the CISO, um, CIO, CRO, whoever is designated as the individual responsible to sign that certificate of compliance on January 15 next year. Um, that person has to be ready um, to be questioned by the examiners um, on more or less the security program of the firm. Um, I, I have been through it um, where you know I've been asked to explain the program no paper, no slides, verbal discussion. So that's the level of expectation that they're going to be looking for, that you can speak about the program as opposed to present about the program. So when that certificate is signed off, the person who is signing off is going to be ultimately responsible to um, more or less communicate the firm's cybersecurity posture to, to the regulators. I guess and in addition to Rich calling out on this slide, you know, the requirement for a notification in no greater than 72 hours mm -hmm. if the firm should suffer a cyber event. So circling back to the previous slide around incident response, mm -hmm. if you don't have that process framed out before the event, I think it would be nearly impossible to put together a complete and comprehensive report within 72 hours. And so you would fall very likely to come up outside of compliance from a reporting requirement, or if you did report, would probably report insufficient. So once again, pretty critical on that incident response plan to know what type of information you're going to gather, who you're going to talk to, who you're going to call to the table, so that when you do send across the report, it can be accurate and as complete as possible at the time. So that runs through our slides that we had for today, and we appreciate everybody's time joining us for today's discussion about the New York Department of Financial Services cybersecurity regulation. We hope that firms have begun making progress going through evaluating how you will not only assess your program, but also how you're going to outline and be in compliance with the required policies and procedures and the specific testing of those policies and procedures that the regulators are going to want to see firms adhering to. Rich, any other parting questions or, or thoughts that we may want to pose to the audience? I, I do see actually a, a question popping up on the screen from a couple of people that if these slides will be made available. So for those of you that have registered, there will be a follow-up email thanking you for your time. We will also include not only access to the slides, but a full replay of today's webinar. Um, but just, Rich, as we were passing back, I wanted to answer that question. Uh, regards to, you know, I guess timing and you know what firms need to be doing between now and when they're going to need to sign off on that regulation. Yeah, definitely. One of the key things um, is that this whole process to comply with NYDFS is not just a check the box exercise. They're going to be looking for the fact that some of the requirements have been implemented, tested, um, and if you're not able to do it, at least show that you have a plan to do it and when you're going to get it done. Um, definitely where you have instances where a third party has to be pulled in um, because not every firm may have the um, expertise or uh, tools in place to get certain things done. Uh, the regulators are expecting that you get it done anyway. So it's very important to understand what your needs will be and, you know, as this has been in effect since March 1st, the examiners are, you know, looking at the fact that you're already doing these things. Um, so definitely it's, it's to make sure that you understand what's required and hopefully you have begun to act on it. And wherever you need assistance, clearly um, a third party is, is, is a very beneficial thing to have in place. Yep, and as we've put up there on the slide, Rich, we've listed some of Cordian's experience in the space. Richard, myself, and our team here has over 20 plus years experience helping firms conduct these types of assessments, dealing with the regulators. So we are not only hopeful that today's webinar provided you some information and some guidance, but also that if you do need some assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Cordium team. We can be reached at um, cyberinfo at cordium.com. And as I mentioned, there will also be a follow-up email coming out 
in regards to any questions you may want to tee up directly with any of our staff. Uh, we are currently in the process of helping some clients prepare for the regulation and we look forward to the opportunity to help any others. I'm just going to take one quick moment to look back and see if we've had any new questions come across. Uh, yes, we do actually have a couple additional questions that I want to key in here for it. So, it's asking about the report. The report's being asked annually, uh, biannually on the penetration testing and the testing of the software and third party, Rich. Um, then it's also, actually next question, is the FFIEC assessment generally considered an, access, an acceptable assessment by the regulators? Rich? Yeah, actually, the, um, that's one of the assessments that you're expecting. The FFIEC assessment, the, the CAD tool is basically looking at your cyber environment, you know, those risks, but you also have to look at your IT environment, and there's a separate way to look at that whether it be through COVID or any other framework. Um, but yeah, the CAT tool is specifically cybersecurity. Um, so the entire environment, especially the IT risk, um, the CAT tool wouldn't necessarily cover that. But there, there are other ways that, that can be addressed. And we had another question here also that asked for a little more information on penetration testing on software and third-party firms being recommended and then what are the requirements specifically around penetration? So I guess, Rich, can you just share a couple of thoughts, I guess, on you know, requirements of the penetration testing, i.e. probably around scope, and then also some of the thoughts on using third parties for penetration testing? Yeah, sure. In terms of scope, again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the penetration testing is two parts, internal and external. The internal would be looking at whole vulnerable how vulnerable your internal network is. So someone would come in, try to break into your, your workstations, your, your printers, your, your servers, uh, your email, um, using whatever industrial tools they have, and report any particular weaknesses. One of the key things to point out is that when the internal test is being done, that there should be, it should be very clear to the tester that there's no exploitation of any weaknesses so that you don't have any disruption in your business. The external pen test, again, should also try to penetrate your firewall um, and, and try to see if there's any particular weaknesses for any uh, hacker externally trying to get into your network. Um, in terms of, um, you know, who does the testing and tools and so on, um, there are several players in the market. Um, I won't necessarily, you know, present any particular names here, but um, certainly, if, if um, you have any further questions on that, we can get back to you guys. Yeah, I think one of the other items, too, on the third parties for penetration testing is you should rotate your vendors mm -hmm. so that a pen tester that comes in this year will not be the same pen tester coming in next year. And a couple of examples and reasons. So when a pen tester comes in, they're looking for their first point of entry and then once they get in, how far they can get in. So I always use the analogy of a burglar going around a house. If there's 10 windows on the first floor, they get in through the second window, they're not going to check the other windows. They'll try to see how deep they can get and what other areas they can compromise. So using another vendor that will come in the next time with a slightly different approach or a different tool will not only, you know, it kind of taken another point of entry for them. So it's, it's definitely valuable because the penetration testing tends to be somewhat talent-based and so getting different views and different thoughts and, and rotating your vendors can be very helpful or even using different vendors over different areas of scope. Um, it is somewhat of a commodity service and so that individualism is, is going to be the difference. And so if you can mix that up, it'll help get you a different look. So just taking a look here, I do not see any other questions coming across for today. So once again, we want to thank everybody for your time. We appreciate you joining our webinar and look forward to any follow-up questions you may have and also your participation in our webinars down the road. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate your help. Thank you, everyone.